1997, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling was published. And in case you haven't heard, it was a success. British kids couldn't get enough of the schoolboy who discovered he was a wizard. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? And the following year, the American edition renamed Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone came out. What? There was a separate American edition? I hear you cry. British English and American English are the same language, aren't they? The change of title was done for reasons of marketing rather than for reasons of linguistic misunderstandings. They, the American publishers, thought the sorcerers sounded cooler than philosophers to American kids and would thus sell more copies. Philosopher, really? Socrates? Nietzsche? No, no, no. But many changes were made to reflect the different vocabularies. Here are a few in the original British version. Can you guess the American? A skip. A dumpster. A jumper. A sweater. Biscuit. Cookies. Cupboard. Closet. Torch. Flashlight. Letterboxes, mailboxes, pants, briefs, penny, apron. There were even some grammar differences. Shan't was replaced by won't, even though in British English we don't use shan't very much, but in American English it's hardly ever used. If Harry Potter had been American, they wouldn't have published a separate British edition. In fact, I can't think of any American book that has had a separate British edition. I grew up watching American TV shows and movies, listening to American music, and I'm sure I've read at least as many works of American literature as I have of British literature. American culture and its language is familiar to all Brits. We know what a dumpster is, even if we don't say it. We'd recognise parking lots and sidewalks even if we say car park and pavement. Today on Let Me Talk TV we're going to look at how America, the small upstart former colony, took the language of Shakespeare and turned it into something beautiful. Well it was already beautiful but they made it distinct and shook it up a little. Whether you like hundreds of thousands on your fairy cakes or rainbow sprinkles on your cupcakes, you'll like this video. So stay tuned. In spite of the vocabulary and grammar differences between standard British English and standard American English, and in spite of around three centuries of separation, they are still mutually intelligible and very close. By the way, a word about terms here. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. There is no such thing as British English. There is Scottish English, there is Welsh English, Liverpudlian, Mancunian, Cockney English, but British English doesn't exist. Dislike, unsubscribe. Wait, please don't write. I've seen that before, but please don't write that. When they pump out these phonetic squiggles in the dictionaries, of Oxford and Cambridge and Collins, they use what we call SSBE, Standard Southern British English, which is mostly the middle class English of the south of England, okay? Mostly, some exceptions we'll, we should go into in other videos, but not here. Likewise, there is a Standard American English, sometimes called General American, which is an accent lacking in regional characteristics that you'll hear across the US and in parts of Canada. But of course, I'm aware that there are many American accents and dialects. But in this video, when I say an American accent, I'm referring to this standard pronunciation. I'm also aware that America covers two vast continents. But when I say an American, I mean someone from the US. With that in mind, let's continue. From the time of the very first permanent English settlement in North America, in Jamestown, Virginia, established on the 14th of May 1607 by John Smith, the English of the New World has been diverging. 
Many new words entered the language from Native American tribes of North America. And here's a list of just a few of them. The Algonquian peoples are a Native American linguistic group that includes a number of tribes in the northeastern United States and eastern Canada. Many of these words came into English simply because they had never been seen before by Europeans and they didn't know what they were or what to call them. So this includes chipmunk from the Ojibwe word ajikdamo, excuse my pronunciation, moccasin from the Powhatan word makasin, pecan from the Algonquian word pakani, skunk from the Massachusetts word sukok, squash from the Narragansett word askultasquash. The native languages also gave names to many geographical features, rivers, mountains, town states that derive from native languages. And these include the states of Illinois, Delaware, Massachusetts, Iowa, Kansas, Alabama, and Missouri. The British were not the only colonists in North America. New Netherlands was a 17th century Dutch colony and Dutch words that entered English via North America include coleslaw and cookies and poppycock and landscape as well as the names of the New York borough of Brooklyn and the neighborhood of Harlem. German immigrants brought us kindergarten, sauerkraut, wiener, hamburger, pretzels and delicatessen. And there is a myth that persists to this day that German almost became the official language of the United States. It's not true. In 1795, there was a vote to have federal laws be published in the state of Virginia in German as well as English. The vote failed by one vote, but German was never close to becoming the official language of the US. In fact, the United States doesn't have an official language. Let's continue with the list. From Spanish, we get plaza, vigilante, rodeo, stampede, and tornado. From French, the Americans took depot, cents, dimes, and crevasse. Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who spoke Yiddish contributed a number of words and expressions. Bagel, nosh, schmooze, chutzpah, and schmuck. From the 17th century until the end of the Civil War in 1865, millions of Africans were kidnapped, transported to, to America and sold into slavery. Some words of African origin entered English from slaves, including jive from Wolof, okra from Bantu, voodoo from the Fon language spoken in West Africa around present-day Nigeria and Benin, and probably... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. White Americans say yay or yes, while slaves said mm-hmm, and this passed into black American speech and later into white American speech. Hello, Mr. Polyakov. I understand you're looking for a couple of girl musicians. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. If we compare... American and British names of some food items, it reveals how immigrants changed the language. In Britain, this is a courgette. It comes from the French, courgette. Our neighbours in France. In America, it's called a zucchini, which reflects the influence of Italian immigrants in the US. Likewise, the British say rocket from the French roquette, and Americans say Arugula, from the Italian. We say broad beans, and the Americans say fava beans, also from the Italian. The British say coriander, from French. The Americans say cilantro, from Spanish. In 1620, the Mayflower set sail from England to what is now Plymouth, Massachusetts. On board were Puritans seeking religious freedom and a new life. They set up one of the first successful colonies in North America and played a key role in the de development of American democracy and freedom of expression. The influence of religion cannot be underestimated. The Spanish, French and other English colonists came to the New World to plunder. 
but the Puritans came on what they considered a mission of God. William Penn, who was a Quaker, the founding fathers were men of religion, such as Thomas Jefferson, who compiled his own version of the gospel known as the Jefferson Bible. Religion is deeply ingrained in American society and culture, and this is reflected in their choice of words. Although Britain has an official religion, speakers of British English have on the whole have been far less concerned with uttering profanities or blasphemies. That explains why in American English you have so many minced oaths. A minced oath is a word that you use in place of a blasphemy or a swear word. And here are a few minced oaths rarely heard in the UK. What the heck instead of what the hell. People will look at that situation and say, what the heck happened there? Gosh darn it, instead of god damn it. Why, gosh darn heck it, aren't conservatives funny? Doggone, instead of god damn. If you've got a room full of people waiting for you and you told them you were going to start at seven, well, doggone it, their time means something. Jeepers Creepers. Ah, Jeepers Creepers. Got some bad vibes in the head, man. What was I talking about? And of course, British English has a few minced oaths of its own, such as call blimey, which replaces God blimey. But I think most people who use it don't know that it has a religious origin. Do you use minced oaths? Let us know in the comments. And this Puritan streak you can see in other vocabulary. We see that this prudishness led to the altering of a number of everyday words. In Britain, you go to the toilet. In America, you go to the bathroom or the restroom or the powder room. A cockerel in British English became a rooster in American English, presumably because the original contained the word cock. Likewise, a cockroach in British English is called a roach in American English. A titbit in British English is called a tidbit in American English. A tidbit or a tidbit is like a little juicy piece of gossip. About every little juicy tidbit of political gossip. It's not like other people, ES3. Fascinating anatomical tidbit. And I'm surprised he didn't think of an alternative word for country. Some English words that are no longer widespread in Britain are preserved in American English. Trash, a quintessentially American word, right? Well, actually, it's a word the Vikings gave us. It comes from the old Norse word toss, which meant twigs or leaves which had dropped to the forest floor. Shakespeare used it. Let it alone, thou fool. It is but trash. Likewise, Faucet, diaper, skillet were used in Britain before they were used in America, but have now been replaced by tap, nappy, and frying pan, respectively. Even though Brits say sweets now, candy is a very old word. The English took it from Old French, and they took it from Arabic, who took it from Persian, who probably took it from Sanskrit, Handa meaning a piece of sugar. Shakespeare also used fall to mean autumn, but that usage is now rare in Britain. And gotten as the past participle of get, it's get got gotten, while the Brits say get got got. Gotten was also used by Shakespeare. And we still have forget, forgot, forgotten. So we use this older form in that verb, and in the expression ill-gotten gain, British English seems to be a bit inconsistent. So one point to American English there. Maybe is an interesting one. It comes from England. It had almost become archaic until Americans brought it back to life and re-exported it to Britain. The same is true of the phrase, I guess, meaning I think. I'm not going to give a long list of vocabulary differences between British English and American English. We already have looked at a few at the start of this video. And I'll just give you a few of these Americanisms that the Brits have willingly adopted. These include cool, skyscraper, jazz, OK, teenager, telephone, email. It's a long list. Others have stayed in America. So 
such as sidewalk, flashlight, dresser, round trip to mean a return. Some words have different meanings in the US and British English, such as chips. Homely, which means a cosy place or a home-loving person in British English, and something or someone unattractive in American English. A geezer is an informal term for a man in British English and an old man in American English. There are many more, I'm sure. You can write your own in the comments. And there are at least two words that have the complete opposite meaning. To table something means to talk about it in British English. I'm going to table this at the next meeting. While in American English, it means not to talk about it. In British English, moot, as in the expression a moot point, means it's relevant. For example, how is our company going to deal with the threat posed from AI? Mm, that's a moot point, Jeffrey. This is moot in American English means it's not relevant. For example, the proposed policy to ban vaping in the workplace is moot since all the employees now work from home. Often British writers have criticised the influx of Americanisms into the language. Their complaints sound quite absurd now. T.H. Huxley complained that the word scientist was an ignoble Americanism. He said, to anyone who respects the English language, I think scientist is about as pleasing as the word electrocution. In 1832, the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge complained about a vile and barbarous new adjective that had made its way across the Atlantic. And the word was talented. Yes, that's right. He said, I regret to see that vile and barbarous vocable talented stealing out of the newspapers into the leading reviews and most respectable publications of the day. Coolridge was wrong in more than one way since talented was in fact British in origin, having been first used in English in England in the 17th century. Let's move on to some grammar differences between British and American English. Perhaps surprisingly, the grammar is mostly the same. There's only one verb which is conjugated differently in Britain and American English, that we've already mentioned. Americans say get got gotten, British say get got got, that's it really. In some situations, American use a past simple, where in British English, we'd more likely use a present perfect. For example, in American English, you might say, I just saw Mary, and in British English, you'd say, I've just seen Mary. American English, I got a new job. British English, I've got a new job. In British English, you might use shall I, or shall we, for suggestions. This is less common in American English. British would say, shall I help you with that? Americans might say, can I help you with that? Pronunciation. Now, I'm not going to take a deep dive into the pronunciation differences between SSBE and standard American English. However, if you want to know more, then check out this video here. But I will say that the pronunciation between British and American English is closer than you might think. It is estimated that two thirds of Americans speak with the same pronunciation. Whereas in Britain, the SSB English is only spoken by about 5% of Brits. That's because there are so many British accents. As Simeon Potter said, it would be no exaggeration to say that greater differences in pronunciation are discernible in the north of England between Trent and Tweed, that's about 100 miles, than in the whole of North America. It's far more difficult for somebody from the south of England to understand a thick Glaswegian accent or a Geordie accent than it is to understand an American English. And the reason for this is the great vowel shift. The Great Vowel Shift was a series of sound changes in the English language that occurred between the 14th and 17th centuries. The way people pronounce long vowels in English gradually changed. Once again, I've covered this topic in other videos, such as this one, and I will do a video just on the GVS soon. So I'll just give you a couple of examples and show you why it's relevant to American English. 
the long e in meat was pronounced air in Middle English. So meat sounded more like the modern English word mate. Stone was pronounced stone. Now in some English dialects, such as in Northumberland, they still say something close to stone. But in SSBE and Standard American, they have the same vowel, stone and meat. Despite the various differences, the pronunciation between Standard Southern British English and Standard American accent are quite similar. And the reason for this is that colonization from England came to America after the Great Vowel Shift. And the immigrants among early English colonizers were from the south and east of England. Therefore, one could argue that the American accent is a variation of Southern Standard British English. The vowel sounds are quite similar. One exception is the short A sounds you hear in American English. The British say bath, while the Americans say bath. Okay. We say can't, Americans say can't. We say path and not path, etc. And this is because in Shakespeare's time, it would have been a short a too. Elizabethans in the south would have said bath and path. Southern English has changed but the old form has been retained in the American accent. The American accent was set quite early on but that's not to say that it hasn't been influenced by speakers of other regions and other areas because 200 years later most settlers from Britain came from Scotland and Ireland. Between 1820 and 1860, one third of all immigrants to the United States were Irish. In the 1840s, during the potato famine, they made up nearly half of all immigrants. There was also a huge number of immigrants from Scotland. In the 2000 census, about 3% of the American population had Scots-Irish descent. Spelling differences. Yes, there are some spelling differences, and this guy can be held responsible. Noel Webster, whose work on the American Dictionary of the English Language, which helped standardize American spelling and pronunciation in the early 19th century, color with a U became color without a U. And here are some of his other changes. And some of these spelling changes caught on in Britain too. Everyone writes jail like this, and not like this. Clue like this, and not like this. And some of his spelling reforms didn't catch on, even though they should have done. Here are a few. Now, I'm an English teacher, and every day I have to correct the pronunciation of women. W-O-M-E-N. And determine. If only they'd listened to Webster. Webster also gave America its pronunciation of the word which, as a Brit, I traditionally say schedule, while Americans say schedule. The word comes from the old French word cédule. Most English words that originate from French con containing a ch are pronounced ch. Think of chef, chauffeur, ricochet, machine brochure, parachute, moustache, etc. But Webster noticed that the French word actually comes from an earlier Greek word. And in English, Greek words with a CH are pronounced with a thick K sound. Think of school, scheme, scholar, schizophrenic. So Webster changed the pronunciation to schedule, to reflect its Greek origin. But with exposure to lots of American media, now lots of Brits say the American way, schedule. Though I continue to say schedule.
the British still have an identity crisis when it comes to the word program, which we usually spell it like this, as the French do. But a computer program is spelt the American way without the M-E at the end. Isn't that ridiculous? Now here are five wonderful idioms that originated in the US. Number one, I'll take a rain check. When someone tells you that they will take a rain check, it means that they cannot accept your invitation now, but it could be possible another time. Or it can also just be used politely to decline an offer. It originally comes from baseball. If you had paid to watch a baseball game, but it was cancelled due to bad weather, you would receive a check that allowed you to watch it another day. It's been used out of the context of baseball since the 1930s. What you need is insurance. Let's talk about it. Um, I'll take a rain check. Bury the hatchet. This means ending a long dispute and making peace. After warring native Indian tribes made peace, they would literally bury an axe or hatchet to symbolize the end of hostilities. This fight's gone on too long. It's time to bury the hatchet. Pass the buck. And the buck stops here. If you pass the buck, it means you pass on the responsibility or the blame onto someone else instead of admitting that it's your fault. If you say the buck stops here, it means that I'm in charge and I'll take responsibility for any problems that arise. It was popularized by Harry Truman, who had a sign on his desk which said, the buck stops here. The buck comes from the game of poker. A knife with a buckhorn handle was used to indicate whose turn it was to deal the cards. The best thing since sliced bread. When we say something is the best or the greatest thing since sliced bread, we mean that it's extremely useful and innovative. This robot that cleans the house is the best thing since sliced bread. A bread slicing machine was invented in the US in the 1920s. Ready sliced bread was revolutionary at the time and a great success. Advertisers frequently used it as a benchmark for comparing new innovations. However, it wasn't until the 1950s that the expression the greatest thing since sliced bread became widely used to refer to anything new and exciting. Selling like hot cakes. Something sells like hot cakes sells easily and in large quantities. Hot cake in late 19th century America was a synonym for a pancake. These were sold at the side of the road and in markets and in fairs. Wow, th these new uh, house cleaning robots are selling like hot cakes. There are many others and some expressions which sound so British are American in origin, such as stiff upper lip, an expression that almost defines Britishness is in fact American. To keep, it means to keep your emotions under control even in the face of adversity. And the first reference to it was a phrase in the Massachusetts Spy in 1815. And it's important not to overestimate the differences between standard American and SSB English. They are, as I said, mutually intelligible. And if you scroll down the 2,000 most common words in American English, they are almost identical to those used in British English. A handful that aren't are still recognisable and understood. If an American hears a British dialect, such as Geordie from Newcastle or Cockney from London, it's more difficult to understand, and American English has its dialects too. But on the whole, we understand each other 100%. But we still have to recognise that the American influence has been dramatic. This is a huge topic, and I've just scratched the surface here. If you want to deep dive into American English of the Jazz Age, Check out the video here. That's all for now. See you soon. Bye.